Hello and welcome to Access Chat. Delighted to welcome Sarah Luthwaite and Anne Harrod butler reese from Southampton University to be with us today. Uh, it's been a long time coming. We know we've been talking about the topic of education and accessibility for a long time, but Sarah and Anne Harrod have been working on a project of researching teaching accessibility. So this is fascinating to me. I'm sure it's going to be fascinating to you, our viewers. So welcome, Sarah. Welcome, Anne Harrod. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about your, your background and what you've been doing? Thank you. Okay, um, well, so I'm somebody who's been working in education technology and accessibility, looking at disability and social media particularly for um, over 10 years and then into inclusive research. I've done disability support, as many of us do. I've sort of started out with an education background. Um, and then through my PhD and so on, I got more and more interested in the ways in which uh, technologies shape experiences of disability, which of course is intimately connected to accessibility amongst other things. And as I've sort of continued on that track, um, particularly from being based in education departments, I became more and more interested in the pedagogy of teaching accessibility. Um, I think we're all aware that the capacity, the skills that are needed in this field now, as more and more disabled people are online, more and more disabled people are using access, um, are using digital tools and so on. It's, it's a really big issue with new legal frameworks, with you know, the moral business dimensions and so on, that we, we have more skills in industry to make the tools and services that people need. So I began looking at the research literature around this, um, probably around uh, 2014, 2015, and I did a short paper with David Sloan, who's now at the Pacciello Group, um, just doing a kind of review of the literature, what was being said about teaching. But in particular, I wanted to see what was being said about pedagogy, um, because there's been a lot of talk, I think, about what should be taught and trying to get it taught, you know, just getting it into the classroom, getting it onto degree programs, into, you know, in, into <laughs> just, just making it happen. And I was really interested in looking at the quality of teaching and what the particular um, pedagogic content knowledge for this field looks like. So trying to get discussions from what we teach to how we teach, that seems to be a dimension that was missing. So that, that's the project that I'm now leading and working with Anne Harrod on, trying to move to looking at how people teach accessibility. And there's lots of reasons for looking at how, but um, maybe I should pass over to Anne Harrod and let her introduce herself and her kind of route into the project. Okay, hi there. So I recently joined Sarah on the Teaching Accessibility in the Digital Skillset project. I'm from a slightly different background to Sarah, so I've had a long-standing interest in digital inclusion and accessibility, um, being visually impaired myself and encountering many barriers to technology um, as a child and growing up. Um, and I've been very involved with a few disabled people's organisations, um, so UCAM Productions, a creative arts cooperative, um, along with charities such as Leonard Cheshire, and I was very involved there in uh, the creation of indoor digital navigation apps and involved in hackathons to help um, overcome some of the problems that disabled people have in accessing technology. And then most recently, since 2016, I've been here at the University of Southampton looking at um, disability activism in response to austerity with major cuts happening at the moment. However, I kind of felt through doing that research that actually a lot of the disabled people's movement's energy has been focused on austerity and actually some of the issues around digital inclusion, uh, which is still very important and we've got a long way to go still, have kind of been overlooked by the movement. So that's kind of what drew, drew me into Sarah's project and has brought me uh, here today. Excellent. I think that's... Um... We're definitely fascinated by the pedagogy. Uh, such a hard word. It's um, a horrible word. <laughs> yeah, I always trip over it. Um, 
and, and, and I, I think we'll come back to this, but I'm, um, but I'd just love to pick up on the point before I hand over to Deborah that Angara just made around the the need to focus on digital inclusion rather than what's bad. You know, there definitely have been you know cuts and and, and political moves to that have been harmful to to the community. But at the same time, what we've not done is focus on what we can do and what we can enable. And I think that the there is an opportunity coming right now, um, certainly in the UK, where there is a renewed focus on looking at um, how we can enable people to, to participate in, in the economy more that really requires the skills to support that, which is kind of feeding into what you're doing. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm super glad to have you here. Over to you, Deborah. Yeah, thank you. I agree. I'm I'm very um, glad that you're here too. I will let everybody know that we're, there's a really big storm in Virginia. So if you notice, my power went out a minute ago. So hopefully, I'll stay on, and um, the wind gods will let me continue. But um, in, anyway, I I really am fascinated with this as well because I have been in this industry many years, and I myself have trained on accessibility. I've looked at. I reviewed a ton of them. I've participated in MOOCs. I've blah, but it is fascinating because we don't always. I also, as a, a former, I, I was in the banking industry for many years, and I was in, in charge of education, um, corporate education for banks. And the knowledge transfer, how you really do the knowledge transfer, is fascinating. And it's fascinating to me because I see people do. Um, they're teaching accessibility, and and it doesn't even make any sense. It, so I'll, I'll teach y'all how to do accessibility right now. All you have to do is anything that you provide graphically, you have to provide textually. Well, I think there's a little bit more to it. So it's just very interesting because a bunch of people are saying, I'm an accessibility expert, and we're not seeing really solid. I, I, I believe we're not seeing as much good solid transfer as we need. And so I don't know, uh, So, but I never thought about researching it to actually see what's happening. So I'm fascinated with what you're doing. And I'm really, I, I'm eager to see any results. Have you all published any of your findings yet? Well, um, I'll answer that in sort of in, in two parts. So um, I think what you're identifying is, is one of the reasons for the rationale for the project, which is we're going to be, I mean, unfortunately, we're not looking at education right across the board. So I'm aware, for example, Neil's doing some great stuff around accessibility apprenticeships. Um, and we know we, there are these issues about which level of education to look at. And Harrod and I are focused on higher education and industry. So that, that's our domain for the project. But you know, it, it, it could be broader than that. Um, I think what I find really interesting about the field is um, this notion of pedagogic content knowledge. So there's the kind of content that is what we might call accessibility expertise, and then maybe the pedagogy, which might be the teaching expertise. And I think um, the evidence at present is that, and there's some great work coming out of the Rochester Institute for Technology, um, Shinohara and others, who you know, did some big surveys of faculty where the teaching knowledge is, and they said, we don't have the accessibility knowledge. That's where they feel they have a weakness. And then in industry, where there's plenty of content expertise, you have you know, the, the experts in accessibility, there isn't necessarily the pedagogic expertise. They're not coming from teaching backgrounds. So that, those are quite different challenges for teachers, and it can lead to a lot of trial and error and so our project, you know, the methods we're using, are not only to try and discover knowledge, but to sort of raise it and give visibility to it, so that people who are teaching and involved in the research get to, <coughs> excuse me, share knowledge uh, around the data, and that we can cascade it in different directions. Um, so you mentioned, are we published from the project yet? Uh, we've got a major literature review of 20 years of literature, um, which focuses particularly on the pedagogy dimension. So that should be, well, we're going to be submitting that in the next month or so. So hopefully that will be out later in the year. Um, we've been doing some policy work, um, sort of 
analysis just to set some of the foundations. So we've got um, a paper for disability in society that's out presently. It's available through our website as a, as a freely accessible author's draft. Um, but we're going to follow that up as well, hopefully, to sort of identify the key motivators in the field in terms of what policy has to say about accessibility in teaching. So, those, so that's sort of a two-part answer. One about this particular challenge of pedagogic content knowledge in the field, and then the other about this is where we're up to. It's still early days, and academic publishing, I'm afraid, is a slow train. <laughs> so, so. Um, well, I we, have a yeah. I have a question to ask either one of you, sort of a follow-on to that. And so, I find it fascinating what you're saying because as somebody that you know, because we don't have necessarily teachers and professors teaching this. I mean, we do have, but n not the majority. And the majority of, you know, a lot of it's self-taught. You know, well, I guess it's all self-taught, right? Because um, there's no, not, we can't go to universities, most of them, to do this. And they, I know there's a few universities that are involved in it, but they're very, very few, very few. And so, I would be curious, were y'all looking at the training, the corporate training that we see happening it, where, where we, some of us, I don't know, I don't know how you would wrap your arms around this, but um, I have my opinions, maybe I'll say it like this, I have my opinions about who is doing effective, good corporate training um, on accessibility, the small vendors, big, all of that, who are effective, who are really trying, who, uh, who are really having success and having the knowledge transfer. So since you can't go to the normal, the, the usual suspects, the, corp the universities, the professors, the experts, the experts are in a different place, which is I, because of the, uh, you know, we're still in emerging field. Um, have you gone to, and, and I'm gonna give a shout out to somebody that I just think is an excellent trainer, um, uh, equal entry, uh, Thomas Logan, who actually happens to live in Japan now, but this is a, United, a company in the United States, and they are some of the best trainers that I've seen. I know, Neil, you've got some really, really good trainers, but they're certainly not, everybody's not created equal. So how do you take those things and apply it? I'm sorry for the hard questions. No, I promise I'm no be these, are the now, questions, but... these are the questions we're asking ourselves. Um, so first of all, you started in a really important place, which is we're talking about a first generation of accessibility teachers, if you like. So in other disciplines, maybe you would teach how you were taught or you would take cues from particular teachers or programs you've been on. And there isn't necessarily that gen generational transfer yet, which, which again is a challenge. Um, and then there's this question of how we're looking at cases. So the notion we're using for recruitment is around pedagogic leadership. So we are looking for experienced teachers and we're also looking for teachers who reflect on their processes in a, in a public way. So um, we see that a bit more maybe in the academic literature. So you get people publishing um, studies based on uh, particular approaches they've used or um, research they've done using particular um, techniques and so on in the classroom. In industry, it's a little bit more challenging because, as you say, there, there are so many different players. Um, and at the same time, there's a question at what level there's visibility. So the, the kind of the accessibility leaders who do the keynotes might not be the people who are doing the training on a day to day basis and have that, um, you know, the, the wider, uh, uh, what's the word, um, the, the set of techniques, the, the, the pedagogic repertoire, really, that, that we're really interested in. So, um, shall I talk a bit about the methods we're using over the next couple of years? Um, so, the, the first thing we're starting with are expert interviews. So, that's finding these pedagogic leaders by consulting with people like yourself about who, who, is, who is doing great stuff in this field. And that's why we're so excited by the access of, you know, the AXS chat is a chance to, you know, really throw the net wide open and engage lots of people in talking about what works for them what doesn't work for them, you know, what, what they've seen that's good, sharing resources, who made them, you know, just raising that level of understanding. Um, so once we've spoken to the experts, we do a take, first take on the data 
and then we're bringing groups back around that data to discuss it. So that's sort of trying to create a learning network amongst the experts. And then from there, we cascade it down through focus groups with people who are teaching every day. And our current plan is to do that by domain. So we know, you know, the people who teach software engineering, people who teach web development, these are going to be slightly different spheres and they may have different take on what resonates with them and what they can add and so forth. So it's a kind of, it, it's called expert panel method and it's about cascading knowledge, sharing knowledge to build different learning communities around the data to enrich the data at different stages before we then, you know, disseminate our findings. So that's our, our next work package. The one after that, we are moving from what people say about what they do to what they actually do in practice. So that's where we're going to do case studies, where we get into the classroom and we use things like um, video elicitation methods. So we might tape what's happening in the classroom. That's not data. We don't use that because I know people can feel awkward being filmed. I think <laughs> I mean, I'm doing this right now and I'm feeling slightly awkward about being filmed. Um, but when you've got that resource, you can then show it back to a the, a group in a focus group setting and say, oh, this really interesting thing happened and you all seemed really energized by it. Or um, I noticed that you started writing a lot when this thing happened. What was going on there? And you can bring teachers and students together or trainers, facilitators and, you know, uh, people in industry together or, to really scrutinize and reflect on what happened. And that can really bring out some of the really tacit knowledge that teachers have, which is hard to reflect on, because I think quite often um, people have more and more knowledge uh, that, that isn't always at the surface. Excellent. Um, I, I've got a couple of things, really. First off, I'm that person doing the public speaking detached from the delivery of the training. I'm absolutely passionate about the need for the training, totally can see it. There are people in my team that have been delivering this. So I think um, if we go back to looking at, at, at the needs of industry, we obviously we know that we desperately need more people to with the right kind of skills to do this. I mm -hmm. think that we're really lucky in that we've, we've now got a, a generation of people, small numbers yet, uh, that have been taught um, systematically. So the guys that have gone through our apprenticeship program have a far more structured knowledge of accessibility than I've ever had because I acquired it through trial and error and through, uh, you know, learning through doing. Now, they've also had that on the job learning through doing, but it's been structured and we've worked out what it is that's needed. So that's the what do we need to know? bit that you talked about before. We, we, we've worked out that bit. What's interesting and what our challenge is as we've been trying to develop a national apprenticeship standard is actually finding people that can then teach what we decide that they need to know and work out how to do that because what we've, what we, we, we had some struggles with our apprenticeship standard because we were saying, well, these are all the sort of things and it looked like we were suggesting that they, you know, have sort of university-based learning for coding and testing and so on. And, and, and people were going, well, that's just sort of normal IT. And, 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 but we're saying, but it's so much more than that. And when we broke it down, what we'd done was we'd put all of the accessibility learning in the, the sort of side-by-side -side learning because we couldn't find any education institutions that were teaching this stuff. So, so I think you know what you're doing is really, really useful because you're understand you're trying to understand what it is you need to teach and how to teach it, and we need to work with you on that because we still need to find people to deliver, um, you know, the the apprenticeship training if we want this to be a national thing, and then um, also we need to be mindful of the fact that we want to encourage people with disabilities to come and learn to be accessibility professionals and that the use of assistive technologies isn't just about support but we need to support learning through the use of assistive technologies so that's going to affect the pedagogy yeah yeah absolutely 
Um, and I mean, that that where the, there are some really exciting connections that can be drawn, because as Anne Harrod knows, we've when we've done our literature review, there was a large literature that we've yet to explore, which was around teaching in accessible ways. So teaching in accessible ways. So a lot around, um, uh, you know, work by people um, like Cheryl Bergstahler at the University of Washington and others who've, who've looked at how to make computer science more diverse and incorporate disabled people and so on. And there's that um, sense in which there are different levels of pedagogy. So we're focusing at the moment at, on this level, which is about teaching accessibility. And then on top of that, there's teaching it in inclusive ways. And, and there's a, clearly a strong overlap because the last thing we want is to perpetuate a discipline which then doesn't uphold the values that are at the absolute center of what we're all trying exactly. to do. And then, Howard, you must have personal experience of this, right? Yeah, definitely. Um, and yeah, as you say, I do think it's, as we've noticed, how can we have a field teaching accessibility, not in accessible ways? We need um, disabled people and allies coming together um, in order to bring about these changes and to work collaboratively. Um, not just in sort of prototyping, but also to see disabled leaders and disabled te teachers too. And I think it's something we're starting to see in the literature. So um, there's been a stream of work at the University of Dundee and elsewhere about involving disabled people in, in delivering the curriculum. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously within being within faculty as well as within the student group. So that, that's something which I'm hoping, again, we're going to touch on when it comes to the AXS chat about, you know, how we get people involved at different levels to really enrich teaching and learning. Well, um, I, I was you know, looking at the both sides, the academia and the enterprise, and looking to um, how people communicate and looking at the same time, how, you know, how they involve what they are in their current work and tasks. And something that, you know, even the way how we, I work in the way how Neil works in the way how Deborah work, works, and even some of the accessibility experts that we had on time, over time on access chat. Uh, I think one of the ways to move forward that, I don't see something like that to be able to run over email. Uh, in terms of engagement and communication. I don't think email would work. I think one of the ways is to try to find a way to build an online platform where everyone can contribute in some way, uh, based on their schedule, based on their availability. Otherwise, it will be really difficult to bring the best people on board. And, and I think something like that would also allow uh, the community, access chat community and other communities out there in an accessible way to contribute themselves to that platform with their ideas. Because we know that not everyone can travel, you know, to, uh, for many people traveling actually a, a, a concern and, and an issue. So I think in, in order to make that something like that going forward, it would require something like that. Otherwise, it will take a lot of time and effort. Absolutely. So we're, we're aware that when we're doing our research, we've got to address an international community um, and international experts and international teachers. And I should say that part, part of what we'll be articulating further down the line, we're going to be running an online conference. So we're really hopeful that a model perhaps similar to what they do with Inclusive Design 24, where we can have you know papers running virtually and some as you say discussion working around that will be really valuable because um a, a key part of developing a culture a, a stronger teaching culture a pedagogic culture is about chances to debate what works and to scrutinize and argue <laughs> and you know propose new ways of doing to be creative uh, about teaching and learning so you know, we're really adamant that our research is not an evaluation 
of what is good and what is bad, because we're a long way from establishing you know, what is most effective and so on. We're, we're really more about trying to see what's happening and shine a light on diverse practice, on exciting areas of growth. Um, so perhaps new sites of learning around uh, um, inclusion and artificial intelligence or robotics, some of these areas. And yeah, just try and build knowledge at these kinds of teaching frontiers, as well as looking at you know, the, the staples, the fundamentals of the field. Yeah, definitely. And also to build community and the importance of building networks um, between those that teach, um, enabling uh, one another to learn from each other and also to see the skills that they have and to reflect upon that collaboratively. Yeah, uh, we're, we're all big fans of networks here. Um, you know, we, we believe in bringing together the, 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 the wider community. I mean, the one of the things that strikes me is the, you know, there's always this cry um, from people in business that, oh, we'd love to employ more people with disabilities, but they don't have the skills. And this whole pipeline issue is, is really significant. So there's the, the pedagogy of um, you know, teaching accessibility. But there's, there's various different angles to this. So there's the teaching the people that teach accessibility and that deliver accessibility, but there's also the teaching the people that just teach. Because when we look at SENCOs, for example, in schools, they have no clue about accessibility. They have, they have an idea about speech and language therapy. They may have uh, ideas about theories of learning and pedagogy, et cetera, but they don't really connect up the digital side of things. And, and so, what we're left with is, you know, pockets of good practice. I hate the words "good uh, best practice" because we can always get better. But um, really, what you know, I, I'd love to see more just embedded into the basic teaching from a very early age, so that there isn't this continual trailing gap that gets wider and wider as people go through the education system because they're not getting the access that they need in order to acquire knowledge at the same pace as all of the other students. It's not that they're not um, capable, um, you know, in terms of intellect. It's the, the gap is around access. It's the gap is around the, the teachers understanding what it is they need to do to enable their students. Mm -hmm. Are you able to address any of that or is that outside of scope of this one and, 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 a, and a whole other can of worms? I mean, I think I think you're raising a really important issue. And as I've mentioned, there's a crossover. So so in terms of pedagogy, student centered pedagogy, inclusive pedagogy is is relevant across you know, all domains in higher education. And I think one of the fundamentals, you know, there, there's been a lot of educational research. And one of the, the key points is you always start from where your students are at. You're always looking to build on what they already know. Because I think we all know that the worst thing that can happen as a classroom is is to be patronised or told something that you already know deeply. Um, so, so that that fundamental principle I expect will be a strong theme in terms of how teaching in this field works. Um, and then the other point you raised. Sorry, I've lost my thread. Um, which is key, I suppose, is that as we've been articulating the research, we've, we've been really keen to make sure that we don't imagine that disability is somewhere else, you know, that it's not, it's not over there. It's part of the student group. It's part of the faculty. It's part of industry. And it's obviously this wider domain that we're seeking to serve. What I think our research does potentially lack and what we're hoping to build out is an understanding of learner perspectives. So I don't think our methodology at present is strong in terms of understanding how learners come to this kind of field. And whilst there's space for that in our case studies, I'm really interested in uh, one of the things you raised, Neil, or rather that I saw as an undertone in what you were talking about in terms of how experts learn, how do we manage our own learning as experts versus how do beginners learn? What do they need to know in terms of the basics to get into the field? And in terms of the balance, 
across industry and higher education, at the moment, I think there's a lot in that basic space and maybe not so much in the more advanced capacity, or at least where that happens, it's very specific, very advanced. And I wonder what that bridging space looks like. So again, that's a, a question for us in terms of how we select cases, which experts we're talking to and so on, in terms of understanding teaching as a whole and developing competencies, not just in terms of accessibility 101, but then you know how you learn to be an expert, how you learn to be a leader, in this field, yeah, no, I think I think that's that's uh, something I've been thinking about for a long time is actually what what the career parts are because actually there's multiple careers in accessibility and this is something that we've been trying to articulate for for some time is that yes, you can come in as as someone you can learn the grounding and get the groundings in assistive technology you can learn about the different aspects of disability and, and accessibility law but then there's specialisms uh, that you can go down or you could be a generalist and you could be a sort of uh, sort of a manager and, and and doing the sort of strategic management of, of accessibility like I've ended up doing which means that I'm uh, you know uh, what was it? Uh, sort of master of none <laughs> but uh, but effectively um, you know, we need to know a lot about lots, you know, enough about a lot of things to be able to pull together the patterns and understand where we need to go. Um, but my my deep technical skills are atrophying daily because I'm not using them, and 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 to a certain extent, I don't need to because I'm there's people that are working, um, that are doing this every day that can do it better and that we train better to do this. Um, but this is something that we've been again working with the IAAP on uh, at a strategic level that we're working with them to look at what strategic leadership in accessibility looks like and hopefully get a, a certification um, mm -hmm. agreed. But there's probably a mid-level as well. You know, there's a there's a accessibility manager. There's there's a, there's a lot going on, but, and also in the different types of industry. So. For example, you've got the whole sort of service management piece, um, go, you know, looking at how do you make sure that people are served and whether or not there's specific uh, accessibility service management, uh, supply chain management, all this kind of stuff. Uh, looking at how do you ensure that accessibility is going through your procurement chain. Um, and then just the whole sort of support piece and, and embedding with technology. And, and I think that people sat on the outside of large organizations sometimes don't really fully appreciate the complexity of the large organizations when they're saying well this bit doesn't work yeah we know it doesn't work but actually the 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 challenges and the various different interplays between the technologies and the pulls between the different needs of the business make it so much more complex to 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 resolve than just going well I'm going to fix this line of code so sometimes I you know uh, I I've digressed again it's one of my habits um, but but essentially I think that there there are these various different quite rich career paths that people could go down that we need to sort of help develop. Um, and that um, you know we're, we're we're not going to be short of work, that's for sure. So um, I've been trying to persuade the, the the young people that are engaging in this that this is a great career to be in. Uh, Antonio, I know you had a question as well. No, uh, I was uh, uh, a few days ago. I was looking for the ISO concept of robotics, and I felt how outdated it is because it doesn't uh, the 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 element that relates with human relations and relationship between robots and humans, the social elements is not captured by the ISO. So what I want to go from here is, you know, technology is evolving so fast. Today we have touch screens, we have voiceover, things are more democratized. How we make sure that as we go along to build these new systems, to help people to learn and, and to, uh, to be better in the way how they learn and how educate accessibility, that we also follow the technology path and we 
make sure that you are in bed these new technologies in the process because you don't want to come to a conclusion and suddenly you have a disruption in technology that discontinues some piece of work that you have done. Well, I'll have a go at responding, but it's <laughs> a tricky question. I mean, again, a unique challenge of the field is how fast it moves. And I think uh, a key concern for many is that accessibility has sometimes been behind the curve. Um, so injecting it as a as a, a like a leading concern is is so vital. In terms of the teaching of these new fields, um, when we've done our literature review, we've identified kind of three aspects of the pedagogy which we find really interesting. The first is about the kind of conceptual theoretical understanding of disability. So how people perceive it and then how that then goes on to inform work. The second is more procedural. So it's the kind of decision making that's necessary when you're working in accessibility to, to make accessible tools and services. And the last is really the techniques. So the particular skills at, at a very technical level that are required. And I think what's and we're aware there's overlap between <laughs> between all these kind of themes. But I think what's really interesting is in some respects, um, new domains can be technical. So you can bring that accessibility mindset in terms of conceptual theoretical knowledge, the procedural knowledge in terms of this is how we approach new issues, uh, new developments, and then the techniques can follow. So I am quite optimistic in terms of how we can put accessibility at the absolute cutting edge and it can maintain its position there. And we all know it's a huge site of innovation in terms of technology, in terms of the web. So um, teaching can be a leading part of that if we have a, a better understanding of what's, what the key issues at stake are. So if we can put that out there for debate and discussion in the community, I'm kind of hopeful that that'll um, mean again that, that that repertoire, that pedagogic repertoire will be more available to people who are at the absolute cutting edge and need to cascade those skills really quickly. So, so that's where I think hopefully our project is going to fit into this wider landscape. Excellent. Yeah. So I, I, I mean, we, we, and we do need to get those skills out really, really quickly as well. I have this really pressing sense of urgency on that. And Harold, you were about to say something. Yeah, no, I was just going to say, I think Sarah brings an important point there, and Antonio, about technology changing so fast. And also, inevitably, that will mean teaching will have to change alongside that. And it really raises the point that we need to be constantly reflecting on teaching. And it's not something that we do want, but our aim here is to establish it as a research field that we can build on and that will inevitably change um, along with changes in technology. Uh, that, that's fantastic. So I think we're all aiming to get to something 1.0, so that we can then take it from there. You know, it's that it's, that, it's establishing that 1.0 that that you know means that we've we've made it to the start line, and then we we can carry on. So I, I'm I'm really thankful that you're doing this work. Um, it's been a fascinating chat. I, I need to say thank you on behalf of Deborah who has been zapped by a lightning bolt somewhere in um, in Virginia and has disappeared. Um, thank you to the people that keep the lights on um, for access chat, so Barclays Access, Microlink and MyClearText for keeping us beautifully clearly captioned. Um, and I'm really looking forward to access chat on Tuesday night because I think that there, there's some really fantastic, there are going to be some fantastic questions and I think it's going to be a rich discussion. So thank you very much, Sarah and Anne Harrod. Thank you. Thank you for having us.